1996, North America was introduced to a new Mario game on the Super Nintendo. But it wasn't just any Mario game. It was a role-playing game. Super Mario RPG, Legend of the Seven Stars. It seemed like an odd idea. Mario in an RPG setting? Mario had been in a lot of different genres. Puzzle games, sports, kart racers, edutainment. But an RPG might have been the last genre on people's minds when it came to the Italian plumber. But Super Mario RPG was a hit, and it's considered not only one of the best Super Nintendo games, but also one of the best RPGs ever made. In Business Insider's list of the top 10 Super Mario games, Super Mario RPG is ranked number 9. IGN placed it at number 10 on its top 100 Super Nintendo games list. Notable JRPG fan and Kotaku writer Jason Schreier lists the game as one of his JRPGs you must play. Super Mario RPG was the result of Square and Nintendo collaborating during their prime. Together, they created something very special. Super Mario RPG is filled with memorable characters, a unique battle system, hilarious dialogue, fun side quests, pleasant visuals, and unforgettable moments. Let's take a look at this classic title and the impact it left on gamers and the industry. Video game developer Square was known for making high-quality role-playing games, most notably their Final Fantasy series. Electronic Gaming Monthly called them the master of RPGs. Square's games sold well in Japan and were a hit with critics. However, sales in the Western market didn't meet expectations. In late 1992, following disappointing sales of Final Fantasy II in North America, Square created a simplified RPG for Western audiences with Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. But people didn't bite. The game only sold about 400,000 copies. Two years later, Final Fantasy VI, or Final Fantasy III in North America, sold more than 2.5 million units in Japan within a few months, making it their best-selling game of all time up to that point. Critics heaped praise on the game, calling it the greatest RPG of all time and a must-own for Super Nintendo fans. But once again, sales in the Western market did not meet expectations. Square needed to break through in the West. It was a challenge they couldn't conquer on their own so they sought the help of the most popular video game character of all time. While Square struggled in the Western market, Nintendo was riding high. Their Super Nintendo console was beginning to outsell the rival Sega Genesis. Children recognized their flagship mascot, Mario, more often than Mickey Mouse. Super Mario World sold more than 20 million units. Even spin-off games like Super Mario Kart were a huge success, selling over 8 million copies. Mario seemed invincible. Shigeru Miyamoto, Nintendo's most well-known game designer and Mario's creator, was eager to try the Italian plumber in other genres, including RPGs. So in 1994, when Square approached Nintendo about collaborating on a new game, Miyamoto was interested. He was a fan of the company and their work. During the pitch meeting at Square headquarters, Square presented Miyamoto and his staff with a picture of a caped Mario holding a sword atop a horse. It made sense considering the source. Most of Square's role-playing games had a medieval fantasy setting. But Miyamoto gave them a puzzled look and said, that's not right. He mentioned Mario might have a hammer, but not a sword. The two companies had intense discussions about the use of characters, story, and setting. Eventually, they agreed to make the game, their first collaborative project with each other. Square began development in the summer of 1994. Nintendo pitched in with Creative Consulting to ensure the game had the Nintendo and Mario flair. Director duties were given to Square employees Yoshihiko Maikawa and Chihiro Fujioka. Fujioka previously worked on Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, Square's first attempt to appeal to Western audiences. He recalled the relationship with Nintendo as being, quote, very close and favorable. Shigeru Miyamoto would come in often to meet and talk, as well as provide suggestions on gameplay. Fujioka said that Miyamoto had two main points of advice in his consulting. One was to, quote, 
keep an eye on handling Mario's entry into the RPG world without destroying the Mario universe. The other was to make the game fun. At first, Super Mario RPG looked like a traditional Square RPG, a top-down view with 2D sprites. Square perfected this look, pushing the limitations of what the Super Nintendo could do with the perspective. But after seeing Rare and Nintendo's Donkey Kong Country, Square was eager to try something new – pre-rendered graphics. They shifted from the 2D perspective to an isometric perspective. This required some extra hardware power to work, so Nintendo suggested they integrate the SA1 chip into the game. The SA1 chip had four times the processing power of the Super Nintendo CPU, and faster RAM. This allowed quicker calculations to render the graphics and show more characters on screen. Square developed the look using the same Silicon Graphics workstations that Rare used to make Donkey Kong Country. By the summer of 1995, Square had a working prototype, but they couldn't decide whether to give Mario weapons and magic attacks or his signature hammer and jump moves. According to director Chihiro Fujioka, he and Miyamoto confirmed their decision at the 1995 V-Jump Festival, where they unveiled the game to the public for the first time. Fujioka asked the audience to applaud for the option they liked best – Mario fighting with swords and magic, or hammers and jumps. The audience overwhelmingly chose the latter. With the game nearing completion, a beta build arrived at the Nintendo of America offices in late 1995. It took the staff by surprise. A few thought it was a silly idea, and were surprised by the RPG battle system menus. In the November 1995 issue of Nintendo Power, one writer commented, It's fun and a little weird, but it's definitely Mario and an RPG. When it came time to translate the game for the West, notable Square localizer Ted Woolsey, known for his translations of Final Fantasy VI and Secret of Mana, got the job. Since their offices were down the street from each other, Nintendo's product analysis team periodically met with Woolsey to make corrections and ensure the game had that signature Nintendo personality. In 1996, the world finally got to play what would become a classic game for the Super Nintendo, Super Mario RPG – Legend of the Seven Stars. It was released on March 9, 1996 in Japan and May 13, 1996 in North America. In Japan, the game came with a coupon to get 4,000 yen off, or about $37 off, the purchase of a Super Famicom system. This was perhaps an effort by Nintendo to sell through backstock of consoles before the release of the Nintendo 64. Unfortunately, Europe would not see the game until years later. Nintendo software analyst Jim Warnell said that the European release was nixed for several reasons the time it would take to do another translation, the added cost of the SA1 chip, and low projected sales all factored into the decision. Super Mario RPG was released just four months before the Nintendo 64, at the height of the Super Nintendo's popularity. For many gamers, including myself, it was a great holdover until the Nintendo 64. Plus, it was a new Mario game. We had to get our hands on it. However, I don't think anyone anticipated just how popular and impactful it would become. Super Mario RPG begins just like every other Mario game. Princess Toadstool has been kidnapped by Bowser, and you have to rescue her. But during the fight between Mario and Bowser, a giant sword falls out of the sky and crashes into Bowser's castle, scattering everyone into different directions. Mario soon learns that this is the work of the Smithy Gang, who have not only taken over the world, but destroyed Star Road, which helps grant people's wishes. Mario and the gang must recover seven star pieces to rebuild Star Road and defeat Smithy. Along the way, Mario meets new characters who join his party. There's Mallow, a cloud who seems to think he is a tadpole, a star spirit who takes the form of a doll, known as Geno. Even Princess Toadstool and Bowser join your party. There's also a ton of memorable, non-playable characters that you will meet along the way. One of my favorite parts of Super Mario RPG has always been the characters and their interactions. Some of the lines are great, and the character expressions are very impressive for a 16-bit title. It's a very funny game. According to director Chihiro Fujioka, many of the staff members who worked on the game were fans of stand-up comedy. It's also a gorgeous game. There is no doubt that Super Mario RPG is one of the best-looking games on the Super Nintendo. Square was definitely stepping out of their comfort zone, but it paid off. 
Everything is bright and colorful, and the isometric view works well without any slowdown. Gameplay is a mix of traditional RPG and action RPG. There's menus, items, equipment, hit points, experience, battle commands, etc., all staples of a traditional Japanese role-playing game. But the battle system incorporates a timing mechanic when attacking and defending. If you time it right, you can hit the A button while attacking to deal extra damage, or hit the B button while defending to reduce damage. According to director Yoshihiko Maikawa, this unique battle system was inspired by a Japanese children's toy. He said it was like a large laptop with these buttons that would play music. You had to press the buttons with good timing to the music. It was that idea, having gameplay built around timing button presses, that inspired me to hybridize these two genres of game, to get a little bit of action and RPG into the same game. Square also incorporated platforming into the game, because what's a Mario game without some platforming? There are hidden treasure chests, coins to collect, and obstacles that Mario must traverse by running and jumping. Instead of random battles, enemies appear on screen. There are also mini-games scattered throughout the world. Yoshi races, a minecart maze, running on barrels down a river, collecting coins in a waterfall, and many more. The soundtrack, a combination of remixed Mario tunes and original compositions, was composed by Yoko Shimomura. She had previously worked for Capcom, where she composed the soundtrack to the popular Street Fighter II arcade game. When she wanted to pursue more classical-style music, she left Capcom for Square. Shimamura considered Super Mario RPG a turning point in her career. Nintendo and Square did a great job ensuring the player felt like they were in the Mario universe. Everything you would expect is here. Goombas, Toad, Flowers, Mushrooms, Warp Pipes, and Hammer Brothers. Nintendo even threw in a few Easter eggs throughout the game. Square threw in a few as well, most notably Culex, an optional boss that wouldn't be out of place in a Final Fantasy game. It's amazing what Square and Nintendo were able to fit in this whopping 32 megabit cartridge. Upon its release, Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars received rave reviews. GamePro Magazine gave it a perfect score, commenting, Once you pick this one up, you're hooked. Electronic Gaming Monthly was similarly impressed, calling it a masterpiece. Super Mario RPG combines the role-playing elements of Final Fantasy with the world of Mario flawlessly. The game was a commercial success as well. More than 2 million units were sold, at a retail price of $75. Square was ecstatic about the numbers. Yusuke Hirata, one of the producers, said that the series would likely continue on Nintendo's upcoming console, the Nintendo 64. However, those hopes were dashed when Nintendo and Square had a falling out. Due to Nintendo's insistence on sticking with cartridge-based media, Square shifted its focus to the CD-based Sony PlayStation for more artistic freedom. This essentially eliminated any hope for a true sequel. Although Square was out of the picture, Nintendo still went forward with the idea. They teamed up with Intelligent Systems and worked on a sequel, Super Mario RPG 2. Possibly due to legal issues with Square, they renamed the game Paper Mario. Released on the Nintendo 64, the game borrowed several elements from Super Mario RPG, mainly the action, timing-based battle system and the humorous dialogue and plot. But Nintendo was able to make the game stand out on its own with its unique paper book visual style. It became its own popular franchise and is still around today. But believe it or not, there is another Mario RPG-inspired game in the form of the Mario & Luigi series. Once again, the game series borrows the action timing-based battle system, as well as the humor. The handheld series of games was developed by Alpha Dream, a company with many former Square employees. One of them is Chihiro Fujioka, the director of Super Mario RPG. Music for the series is composed by Super Mario RPG composer Yoko Shimomura. Even with two spiritual successors, fans still clamor for a true sequel to Super Mario RPG. However, Square Enix holds a lot of the rights to the game, so it would take some licensing and legal hurdles to make something happen. There are a few references to the game in other titles. Gino makes an appearance in Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga, and as a Mii Fighter costume in Super Smash Bros. But that's about it. In 2008, Europeans were finally able to play the game, when Nintendo released Super Mario RPG on the Virtual Console. Super Mario RPG left quite an impact. For many fans of the Mario series, it was their introduction to the RPG, and it made them permanent fans of the genre. 
It was also Square's big break in the Western market. Super Mario RPG outsold all of their previous releases on the Super Nintendo, and helped them see what works and what doesn't in the West. Super Mario RPG is a classic. If you don't already have it on Super Nintendo, it's readily available on Nintendo's Virtual Console service. We may never see a true sequel to the game, but sometimes it's best to go out on top. That's all for this episode of The Game and Historian. Thanks for watching. Funding for Gaming Historian is provided in part by supporters on Patreon. Thank you. Hey everybody, just a quick reminder, there's still time to pre-order The Gaming Historian Volume 1 on Blu-ray. The Blu-ray has 16 classic episodes plus 5 hours of exclusive content. So click the link to the right to order your copy today.